Bear with us for a minute. Yeah, we're getting all the te technical, all the yes, all the technical accoutrement set up. Mm. But I'll parlay what he said. <laughs> concur, I concur, sir. Okay. We now have a microphone that is now set up, picking up voices. Fantastic. <laughs> I've even highly minimized my tabs, but my computer is still taking some time to. Oh, it's because it wants us to. It's probably because I'm live streaming two different live streams right now. Oh, yeah, totally. I wonder where the best place to put this is. I think yeah. I have content. Nice slides. Oh, right. Yeah, no, I mean, That's it good. was, uh, you know, thanks Google for uh, creating these themes that I can just like jump in and mess with. <laughs> Make it look all professional. Amazing. I think that's, I think that's gonna pick up our audio pretty well. Yeah. Thing right now, screaming. I shouldn't scream. Even though I'm not excited, I don't think Twitter is that excited. <laughs> AWS. Put oh, a serverless on there. You gonna yeah. retweet? <laughs> yes. Oh, AppSync with the and. Yeah, that's why. Yep, I knew. I knew it didn't look right. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Who wanted to tag serverless? Oh yeah, we should do that. Um, you can tag me and, and, and wait, is this on? This is Twitter. This is our SG Twitter. Oh, okay. Um, no, leave, leave serverless off. Okay, um, you can tag me on there and then yourself as well. That's cool. Prototype. That's huh. cool. But why don't I own that? <laughs> it could be Joshua Pios. No, prototype is good. Probably. Yeah. Origin to yeah. I think it's like. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, and then throw the link on there too. Yes. Yeah. The most important part, really. <laughs> Sweet. You can see our face already. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's exactly what we want. Yeah. Chair now. Oh, the chair. We're good. Cool. Bada bing, bada boom. Perfect. If you want to slide over a little bit. Yep. Get this going. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I am Josh Proto of Serverless Guru, and we have here our amazing and hardworking CEO and founder, Ryan Jones. Thank you for taking the time today to uh, give a little give a little talk on AWS AppSync. And uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually just gave this talk to a bunch of people last night. Yes, too. I gave this talk last night at phase two. Awesome. Um, and so it's still fresh in the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, started around like 6.30 last night, so should be pretty good. Got a lot of good feedback from the GraphQL community, so. Cool, and that's just a startup here in Portland, phase two? Uh, yeah, so phase two, they have their own office uh, over in Pearl District, and good. they host the GraphQL meetups uh, once a month. So if you're interested in GraphQL, definitely swing by there. Uh, mm -hmm. They've got a Actually, the community is really nice, and their setup was very interesting. Good. So, something that's completely off topic, but what I really liked about the the space is that they have the audience uh, in chairs sitting in front of the screen, mm -hmm. which is which is normal. Yeah. But the speaker isn't in front of everyone, looking at the audience. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're next to the audience, looking at the screen. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. what it felt like is that the speaker <laughs> and the audience are a little bit more like closer together, they have yeah. the same perspective. Yes. And so when people ask questions, they turn to their left mm -hmm. versus having to like okay. stare. Yeah, so stare up yeah, so there's not this like, it's like an indirect thing. It's probably just because they don't have the space for it, but I actually thought it was kind of interesting because mm -hmm. I had a whole bunch of people ask questions. Yeah, so. wow, great. Yeah, a little uh, little speaker, speaker insight right there. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so I think we'll let you take the reins, Brian, uh, and you know, off to the races on AWS AppSync.
Cool. Thank you. Okay. And uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those in the New York time zone or overseas, it's a uh, different time zone. So probably it's either nighttime or you're three hours ahead. So you're eating lunch right now. Um, but yeah, so as the slide says, um, I thought it was kind of funny after I looked back on this, after writing it, yeah. it's kind of like, man, yeah, I'm definitely a developer because the way that I wrote these slides was very developer focused. So this is a talk on AWS AppSync, very like succinct and just like straight to the point. Yeah. Um, and it's about reducing backend complexity. So backend complexity, we talk about backend, we're talking about APIs, uh, complexity being that when you create APIs and for like serverless applications, um, it's going to be complex a lot for a lot of companies and even for people that do it every single day. Um, and that's just because there's a lot of gaps in once you give up a little bit of control to that cloud provider to provide, uh, you know, the serverless uh, stuff for you to work off of these like managed services. Once you give up that control and you hand it over to them uh, and all you're doing is uploading your code and then running it, what happens is that you now have to play within their playground and you have to know how to do all those things effectively, right? Um, whereas before, maybe you took your application, you build an API, you would run it on a server, and when you run it on that server, you have full control over everything. It's your environment. You install the packages. Uh, you can do whatever you want. In this, um, you need to rethink how you do local testing, how you do observability, monitoring, all those different factors. So let's get into it and take a look. So here's my background. Um, so founder and CEO of Serverless Guru currently. Um, a senior cloud developer at Mo2, which is another consulting company. And then prior to that, I was an application engineer in the Nike Innovation Engineering Department. And while I was there in, at Nike, that's when I first started working with the serverless framework, building serverless applications. Um, and that was kind of what kicked off my whole career. So, mm -hmm. so what is AWS? Um, I, I chose to make these slides based on another developer approach, which is when you're a senior developer, uh, what you'll do, or if you're a developer in general, what you'll do is you just go on to Google, you search what your question is, you copy some code, you put it into your application, you test it, you modify it. And so this is kind of what this what these first slides are. Mm -hmm. I thought, why should I reinvent the wheel? Someone's already said it. I'll just let them say it and get to the stuff that I want to talk about. So AWS would be a cloud provider and they allow you to utilize their services, uh, virtual machines, containers, cloud functions, and they have different pricing models based on the scale of your company. Um, so it doesn't actually scale like, oh, we have 100 employees, so then our cost is different. It scales down to the per second use or per minute use. And that allows people like startups to only run very infrequently because they don't have a lot of traffic because they're, mm -hmm. still, they're still small. Whereas like a big company, uh, you know, like Nike or something, they would need to, uh, they would be handling a lot of traffic and their AWS bill would be a lot different. Of that. So uh, AWS, very flexible. It's just basically little services that you can plug into your applications uh, to build cool stuff. So one little tiny example, uh, if you think about like, how do you store images, right? So like, how does Instagram work? Well, users can upload images and then those images have to be stored somewhere. So AWS has a service called uh, S3 and it stands for uh, something something storage mm -hmm. uh, basically, static, so yeah, static storage. yeah exactly so um basically three s's but it's for storage so it can store images uh you know videos pdf documents mm -hmm. anything like that um it's simple storage solution there it is yep. uh, it's still early so the the good thing about that is that you can mm -hmm. plug and play uh this kind of s3 solution and you don't have to have a server running that hosts that has your images stored so it offloads it to s3 and the cost per gigabyte is super low. And that's kind of the point of what AWS is. So moving on, mm -hmm. what is API Gateway? So I wanted to touch on API Gateway prior to moving to AppSync. And that's because there's two fundamental differences uh, at play. So AWS API Gateway is for REST APIs and AppSync is for GraphQL APIs. And so API Gateway was like the version one mm -hmm. And now we're seeing GraphQL be this kind of version two yeah. uh, that's emerging. So API Gateway is a fully managed REST API service, and you can connect and create API endpoints and then connect those to Lambda functions. And those Lambda functions will then run, you know, what your, your backend logic is, so your business logic. Um, you know, for instance, it goes to the Lambda function, talks to the database, stores some new record in there, 
and then comes back to the Lambda function, and then back to API Gateway, and then it responds back to the browser. And so it's kind of just the very standard way of uh, building these APIs out. And for a long time, we used REST APIs. And uh, in the next slide, we'll talk about the pros and cons of using API Gateway after this slide. So here's an architecture diagram. Um, to give you an idea, you have this guy on the left, actor, and then uh, it, basically this actor makes a request to uh, an API URL. When that happens, mm -hmm. it goes to API Gateway. And then from there, the API Gateway, based on the path, so like for instance, let's imagine slash users, right? So this API is for creating uh, new users, updating users, deleting users inside of a database. And so when it first goes to that Lambda function, it'll then go to DynamoDB and DynamoDB will then, uh, you know, take the operation that they're trying to do, uh, create, update, delete, et cetera, um, and then respond back with the data to the user. So that's kind of been the model currently. So every API gateway endpoint is connected to a Lambda function. And that's kind of, that's the basic thing to understand here is that there's, there's kind of three different services to make this CRUD functionality happen. API gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB, or RDS or some other database, right? And so what are the pros and cons of API Gateway, right? So the pros would be, it's easy to set up and start. So if you wanna create a POC, um, a proof of concept, you wanna build something very quickly. REST APIs, there's less automation required. Uh, it's been solved thousands of times and there's tons of tutorials. So you can always feel like, um, like you, you'll always have some type of solution there, right? So um, there's always good documentation and things like that. The cons of it is there's no built-in documentation. Um, so there's documentation to teach you how to use AWS uh, API Gateway, but the documentation for the API itself, that's something you have to do completely outside of it, right? Um, so a big fundamental difference with, with AppSync is that as you create uh, APIs, it also documents the APIs. Yeah. And so it, it creates documentation for you. And that's a really big benefit of not only AppSync, but GraphQL underneath it. The cons of API Gateway, another one. So you can do Swagger. Um, so if you're not familiar with Swagger, Swagger is a way to define an API schema for REST APIs. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to have documentation on that. However, when you connect Swagger to API Gateway, it's a nightmare. So basically trying to hook this schema up, which was written for non-serverless environments. Mm -hmm. So you're porting this like non-serverless Swagger document to a serverless uh, API, AWS API gateway uh, type of structure. And what happens is that those API gateway endpoints have to connect to Lambda functions. There is a plugin to do this. Um, however, the plugin, um, it ends up becoming completely unreadable when you try to rerun inside a Swagger uh, UI. And so we've, we've had to do this for a client as like a very hacky workaround. Um, it's not something I would recommend um, out of the gate because it took a lot of manual little tiny changes and it's hard to train somebody on like all the, the moving pieces there. So uh, that's one big thing. So what is AppSync? So AppSync is a fully managed serverless GraphQL service uh, real-time uh, real data queries, uh, offline communication, and it basically creates the, the platform for you to work off of uh, to do things with uh, GraphQL schemas and connect to other AWS resources very easily. So what is GraphQL? So underneath AppSync is GraphQL, and GraphQL is a data query language. Um, it allows you to create queries and mutations um, it allows you to define types of data. So you now have like data types and all these things happen uh, using GraphQL's language. Um, and it's almost like a programming language in itself, um, but it's a static file. So that static file is read um, by the, the uh, GraphQL engine. And then you're basically able to execute queries against it. So um, in this case, our GraphQL schema will be passed to AppSync. And then that will then allow us to uh, execute all of our queries and mutations against it. So GraphQL schema, as we just talked about, um, these are the spec for your API. So all the, like for instance, let's take an API example. We're going to create a new user in a database, right? Um, so what this, what this 
uh, schema needs to have is the properties inside of uh, creating a user. So that would be like name, ID, uh, maybe address, all those different fields. And so what you can do with GraphQL that you can't really do with the REST API is you can actually have the properties and whether or not they're required um, and what the data type is. Maybe it's a string, maybe it's a number, maybe it's an array and so on, right? And so um, that's what GraphQL gives you is this kind of data typing. And that's the big fundamental difference. So what are the pros and cons of this uh, in working with AppSync? So the pros are you get built-in documentation. So as you create something, it's self-documenting uh, automatically. When you, it's very easy to connect it to other AWS resources, as we'll see uh, in the next slide. And so that would be like AppSync can connect to Lambda, it can connect to Dyna, DynamoDB, and it can also connect to RDS, and so uh, as well as a few other ones. There's uh, this thing called VTL files, and we're going to talk about this more towards the end. But VTL files, velocity templating language. And these are like static files that you can write similar to like JSON files. Um, and then you can put your own logic inside of there, like if else statements, for loops, um, all that stuff. And in that case, you never actually have to have a Lambda function. Um, so there's a whole section on this later, so I'll, I'll not go too deep into it. Uh, and then AppSync also suggests best practices. So if you're trying to create GraphQL by yourself, you're gonna have to know all the different structures and you're gonna have to create the queries, the mutations, um, the data types, and also like the subscriptions for like the real time communication. What AppSync does is it can actually tell you what, what you need, right? So it can tell you the type of things that you're missing in your schema. And it can also scan a database and then generate a GraphQL schema with those best practices. So for instance, let's say you had a DynamoDB table with all of your data already inside of it. You could actually go into AppSync and say, here's my table, scan it, and then create a schema out of the data that already exists. And it'll do that automatically. And then you already have all the queries, mutations. So we're talking like, um, imagine we have a user's table and then we wanna create full CRUD functionality. So create, read, update, delete for that user's table. What can happen is AppSync will scan it and then create all the different data types and the queries and the mutations to do full CRUD functionality against your existing data, against the existing data like mm -hmm. uh, columns and all that stuff. So it's a, it's a really, interesting topic, which uh, I don't think is talked about too much. And it's, there's been some conversation mm -hmm. around like, if it can scan your data and automatically generate a schema, yeah. which could take hours to write manually, mm -hmm. then what if you just populated your database with, with dummy data, with yeah. big data, and then just scanned it? Um, and that's something that uh, I asked Nader Dab at that uh, back and maybe like the like early 2018 or the yeah. end of 2017, like a few months after they launched the service. Um, and I think like the, the answer was like, I don't know, maybe people are already doing that, not really oh. sure, but it seemed like that might have. So hopefully in the last year, uh, there's been some progress there because it seemed, it seemed kind of interesting. We'll have to test it. Yeah, exactly. if you're listening, test it right now. Let us know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've done that before, that would be something really interesting to know about. If yeah. people haven't done that before, Somebody got somebody needs to create some type of plugin or some automation yeah. to do this. You know, tell me what your data is, spit out a schema automatically for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then also there's there's support for subscribers with AppSync, so uh, you can do real time communication. Um, I heard Nader Davit this morning talk about that underneath that subscription is actually like MQTT, which is a a way of opening up like uh, web sockets and all that stuff too have this real-time communication flowing. So you can imagine it like when you send a, when you send like a Slack message or a group message or, or an email, you could have your email open on your phone yeah. and also your laptop. And when you send an email, you can see it show up as sent mm. on both simultaneously. And that's what AppSync allows you to build. So you can build things like a Gmail system with that real-time yeah. communication on multiple devices. Uh, the cons, uh, it sounds like it can, do, it can do a ton and it can, the cons of that is a little bit harder to set up. Um, so more advanced things take a lot more knowledge and it's also more difficult to create POCs. Mm -hmm. So proof of concepts, uh, you know, usually you don't know all the stuff going for or uh, before you start, right? So 
how do you define a schema and a, how do you define all the data types yeah. and all the structure without knowing what you're actually building fully, right? Um, so in that case, the REST API is a little bit better um, because you can just easily create the REST API. You don't have to think about how it's going to work ahead of time. Um, and then later on, you could then move to something like AppSync and actually create that schema. And that's what I would actually recommend. Um, as much as I love AppSync, I think that if you're just starting and you're not already an established <laughs> business uh, where you're very familiar with all the different um, little details about your, uh, your application, I would actually start with the REST API, create that first, use a Lambda function connected to the API gateway um, to then run your, your backend logic. And just start with that, build out your application functionality. And then once you feel that you have an actual solid understanding of the things that are involved in your application, then you could look at moving to something like AppSync. And you're not going to waste a ton of time refactoring all your schema over and over again um, as you try to figure it out on the fly. So, And then VTL files, uh, so as good as they can be because they take away the Lambda function, which we'll get into, they're also a nightmare to write. Um, so when you think about a JSON file, this like static file, mm -hmm. and then you think about adding if statements and for loops inside of it, mm -hmm. you're like, what? Especially if you haven't heard of velocity templating language before, yeah. the thing that might hit you is like, that sounds horrible <laughs> to develop with. Um, and it's not the easiest thing, honestly. Um, to do very complex things with a VTL file, you have to know the language pretty well. And you also can't do like, you can't write, write it like JavaScript. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a whole, it's a whole other thing. Um, automation, much more involved. So as we talk about like, there's a schema, there's like these resources being connected, there's all this other stuff happening that requires uh, some infrastructure as code uh, to support all of that. So with the REST API and something like the serverless framework, it could be three lines of code to create your API. With AppSync, it's gonna be 40 to 50 lines of code. Yeah. Um, and then to add other stuff to it, it's gonna go from 50 to potentially like 400 lines of yeah. code. Um, and that's to automatically create it and make updates using something like the serverless framework. Um, so let's move forward. Okay. So this is what an architecture diagram would look like for this. So you have the user, they make an API request to a URL. That URL then goes to AppSync. And AppSync will then automatically route to DynamoDB or RDS or AWS Lambda. And so the big thing to understand here is that, I think you can see my mouse, um, DynamoDB would be the NoSQL database uh, offered by Amazon. And then underneath that, RDS would be the fully managed MySQL or Postgres database. Mm -hmm. And then you would have AWS Lambda. This would be like the replacement for a traditional server or a container. And so AppSync can use these different services because of something called data, data sources. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So data sources are kind of these AWS services that can connect directly to AppSync. Mm -hmm. And then what AppSync has is your schema.graphql, right? <laughs> so it has your GraphQL schema. And in your GraphQL schema, it will actually have these functions. And those functions are called resolvers. And so your resolver will be attached to a data source. So for instance, let's imagine like get users. So get users would be the function. That function connects to DynamoDB. And then in between that, you have these VTL yeah. files that automatically map the request and response back uh, without having a Lambda function. So this is a very, if this is, this is like some high level or like some low level jargon, I can imagine. Um, but I think by the end of it, when you see the VTL files, everything will start clicking about like how this actually works. Mm -hmm. But the big thing to just understand at a high level is if you use VTL files and app sync with something like DynamoDB or serverless Aurora RDS, you can actually have no backend logic, um, nothing to debug, right? So let's, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, so what are the key concepts of AppSync? So there's a GraphQL schema that's attached to AWS AppSync. Uh, the resolvers are linked to data sources and GraphQL data types. Uh, data sources like databases, uh, AWS Lambda, HTTP endpoints, those are all connected to those resolvers. Um, and then velocity templating language files uh, remove the need 
to be connected directly to a Lambda function. So this is kind of getting to this uh, no code uh, backend. Here's an example of what an architecture diagram would look like. So this is chat QL. Uh, we wrote an article about this a while back on the Medium publication. Uh, we also showed you how to set up something like a, this like real-time communication. But in this example, we have on the far left, we have Amazon Cognito. So for instance, it says user authenticates and retrieves credentials. So that means the user just signed into your application. The user then sends a message. That message is a request that gets sent through an API request. Uh, the API request goes to AWS AppSync and AppSync will then pass that data to a resolver. Um, the resolver is hooked up to either a Lambda function or some other data source like a database directly. And so then resolver goes to the database, stores the data, uh, the user message, then comes back to AppSync and responds back to the user. And if you use uh, AppSync and GraphQL subscriptions, <coughs> then you can actually see that data on multiple devices. So as the data is updated inside of DynamoDB, if you have a subscription to that data, all the other users on the platform will see it. So you can imagine a Twitter example where the user is sending a tweet, that tweet then gets stored inside of a database. The, the app sync is subscribed to that database and that specific data, mm -hmm. and then it updates all the devices uh, simultaneously. And so then everybody can see that one global feed where new tweets are coming in uh, every second. So deploying app sync. So a big thing is like, now that we've talked about a lot of high level concepts like architecture diagrams, how all this stuff works, um, getting into deploying app sync, this is a whole other thing. Um, and this is something that you need to consider. So when I talked earlier about, you know, three lines of code to create a API gateway yeah. with Lambda function uh, connection uh, using the serverless framework. And then the app sync difference of being like 50 lines of code. Um, we're gonna get into the app sync part using something that came out yesterday. Um, so I, I gave the talk at phase two yesterday. Yeah. And because I procrastinated, um, people reaped the benefit um, because that morning, uh, the, the serverless framework team came out with a, a new serverless component, which allows you to do a whole bunch of functionality in a very small amount of code. And so let's take a look at it. So serverless app sync, serverless components. So high level components, um, when you talk about infrastructure as code, you have these very large files and it defines your database and your Lambda function and your API. Well, the thing that the serverless framework was kind of like, well, the average user doesn't need to know how the nuts and bolts work, right? Um, this is the same thing of like, you can drive a car without knowing how to fix an engine, right? You don't need to know how all the different parts work, but you can drive the car by just pressing the gas. And so serverless components kind of hit on that uh, concept of making things very